Welcome to the Flint Catholic Podcast. I'm Father Tony Smila, and today we're going to interview uh, Mr. Randy Petridis and his new book, How the Saints Shaped History. All right, welcome to the Flint Catholic Podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me. I Absolutely. appreciate it. Absolutely. So, Mr. Petridis is uh, retired after 40 years of practice as a lawyer. He holds degrees from the University of Michigan and Notre Dame Law School and has a master's in theology from Franciscan University in Steubenville. He resides in Michigan with his wife, Elizabeth, of 43 years. And they have five children and 16 grandchildren. With one more coming. And another one coming. <laughs> so this book is almost already out of date. At least your, your bio is which is great. <laughs> and, and most importantly about your bio, um, you grew up across the street from, uh, from me. Absolutely. So for 18 years, we lived uh, across the street from each other. And it's such a blessing to see you grow up and uh, to come into your wonderful ministries now. So that's great. Well, thank you. Um, so let's talk about your book. Um, so How the Saints Shaped History. This is a really cool book, and uh, you can order it now on uh, Amazon, I'm assuming, and all the different places. Where can we find this book? Okay. Uh, uh, OSV, is our Sunday visitor, is the uh, publisher, and they, through their bookstore, have it at osvcatholicbookstore.com. All right. Uh, Amazon has it as well, and they have it already up on uh, their uh, both their print edition and their Kindle. Barnes & Noble has it on Nook for those uh, who wish to go. Um, that route as well. So it's out there. It's available uh, across the country and right here in Flint as well. Awesome. Fantastic. So first of all, um, tell us a little bit about the book. What is uh, the book about? What's the, the general structure of the book? Well, uh, uh, Father, there are a lot of wonderful saint books out there, and I've read them, and they're inspirational uh, as well they should be. And there are a lot of good uh, histories of the church out there too and they're wonderful and I've read a lot of them as well but I found that there wasn't really one that put the two together mm. directly where the saints uh, would be looked at as the ones who drove who impacted the history of the church because unlike the, uh, say a history of Europe or the history of the US uh, the history of the Catholic Church is different because it's a divine as well as a human institution. So how do you see how God worked in the course of these last 2,000 years while well, you look at the people who are closest to him, the people who are most open to his grace and followed him most sincerely, and those are the saints. So if you, what I tried to do is to show how if you look at the saints in their context of history, you can see how God's worked uh, th throughout the course of the last 2,000 years. Yeah, I love that. And uh, I love the way your daughter described it as well. Um, it's uh, a history book with the saints as the protagonist. Yes. Which is so cool. It's such a great way to put that. Um, I love this Love this book. And uh, a couple of years ago, you gave me a draft of this. And, and I taught eighth grade church history from, from that draft. And man, that was, that was absolutely fantastic. And, and the eighth graders really were able to, to uh, they, they ate it up, you know, teaching from the, the perspective of the saints, the real people who lived through this, who made an impact in history uh, was absolutely fantastic. There's a couple of pieces in here I do want to point out as well. At the very beginning, I love the, the timeline that they put in. This yes. is, and it's, and it's it color coded as well by, by chapter and major section, which I really love. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of the, uh, um, the, uh, the Bible timeline from uh, Ascension Press because they've got that color coded timeline. Mm -hmm. yes. I like color coded things, it keeps mm -hmm. things simple for me. Um, but there's a very beautiful one here at the beginning of this book. Um, so, what inspired you to write this book? Well, uh, after I retired six years ago, I was able to finish getting my master's in theology from Franciscan University. And when I got done, I said, you know, I can take that certificate and I can hang it on the wall and I can say, wow, I did that. And uh, uh, check, move on to the next bucket list thing. I said, no, I got this for a reason. I wasn't sure exactly what it was, but I've always loved to write, uh, Father. And I've written this and that over the course of, of my life. And uh, I, um, I worry about uh, cleaning out adverbs and adjectives and that kind of thing. So uh, I'm that kind of a writer. And uh, um, I loved hist my history courses from Steubenville. And so I put together a, uh, a series which uh, I gave at my parish, Holy Family in Grand Blanc, in 1919. 
And then a few months later, uh, I attended a Catholic writer's retreat put on by Father Peter Stravinskis uh, uh, out on the East Coast. And all the people there, when I told them I was thinking of writing this, they said, go, do it, do it, do it. And so I did. And, uh, and as I got into it, it kind of more from a, a church history to, oh, look at what the saints did. And I started putting the two of them together. And so it was an evolution as I was writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the kind of the source of the inspiration for it. Yeah. And as, as you're reading this too, you know, you get a big chunk in the fr a beginning of like, here's the, you know, 30,000 foot view of what's happening in this section of, of world history. Um, but then as you start going uh, a little bit deeper into it, you notice uh, all these bold names pop out and they're, they're everywhere in this book. And every time there's a saint, mentioned you put them in bold and it's it's super cool to see that uh, and so this book is just filled with different saints and their biographies and so so i have to ask this well, who is your favorite saint well uh whenever i'm asked that kind of question i have a real hard time coming up with one so i'll give you just a few uh, a menu of a few uh, sure. early on uh i'm a great admirer of saint Irenaeus of leon uh he's just an amazing man and he was very instrumental in um getting the New Testament going because he quoted uh, the Bible, New and Old Testament, in his uh, voluminous writings. He was like the first great theologian of the church about a thousand times. And he mm -hmm. quoted the Gospels and he called them Gospels and he quoted from the letters of Paul and the others. So he was very important for the development of that, which is interestingly, most uh, church histories don't talk about where the Bible came from. Yeah. Well, I have a chapter on that, by the way. Um, so he's one. One more obscure saying a little bit further that uh, I just I just love is I never heard of her till I wrote this book, and it's Saint Clotilda. Have you ever heard of her? I've heard of her, but I don't know much about okay. her. Well, she was a beautiful princess in France in the late 400s, and she caught the eye of Clovis, the king of the the pagan king of the Franks. Uh, who decided he was going to marry her, and uh, kings can get their way, so he did. Well, she spent the next few years doing everything she could to convert him to Catholicism, and she succeeded. And, bec and the Franks at that time were becoming the dominant tribe. They were dominating the Goths and the Vandals and all that. And because he converted to Catholicism, the Franks became Catholic. And that had a tremendous impact on the history of the church going yeah. forward. You know, his ancestors included Charlemagne uh, and the Holy Roman Empire and all that. So she was one. Um, I, uh, I love St. Catherine of Siena. Um, and I think St. Francis might probably be the greatest icon of Jesus Christ uh, in the history of the church. Yeah and uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, and I'm probably forgetting the one or two that I would like to mention, uh, um, but you know, I feel I kind of had a, almost a prayer partnership with St. Therese, mm -hmm. and uh, so I really appreciate her, and uh, interestingly, uh, Dorothy Day mm -hmm. has written a beautiful biography of her. She makes yeah. her come to life, and you never would have thought, you know, Dorothy Day, the biographer, yeah. and she herself may be uh, canonized as a saint here down in the, in the future too, as well. So those are some I could go on, but uh, I know that's way more than one. Yeah, it's like asking me what my favorite book of the Bible is. Like, <laughs> well, what are we reading today? <laughs> exactly. Yep. Well, good. Uh, is, was there any saints that surprised you once you learned about them in researching for th this book? Um, saints that surprised me. Um, well, uh, I don't know if it's a surprise so much, but uh, um, just admiring the grit uh, and, and doing things that I could never have done was St. Athanasius. Uh, is he was the MVP of the fight against Arianism. If it wasn't for Athanasius, we would all be Arian today. Mm -hmm. And we'd be talking about the Athanasian heresy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but he was exiled from his office as Bishop of Alexandria in Egypt five times. Oh my God. Which means he never gave up after the first, the second, the third, or the fourth times. And I, wow. I guess I was, we call it a little bit of surprise, maybe more admiration. You know, he could, twice he was uh, sent out to the Sahara, and, you know, he could have just grabbed a sandwich and hit balls into the sand. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but he just kept fighting, fighting, fighting. And uh, whether you call, again, whether you call it surprise or admiration, uh, uh, his grit and his uh, perseverance was just, was overwhelming. And he also, I didn't know this until I got into him, 
he was perhaps the first person to say, these are the 27 books of the New Testament. Oh, wow. He put that out in a letter in, I think, 367. And uh, the New Testament was, had been coming together over the course of the previous 150, 200 years, but they weren't sure just which books uh, should stay and which books sh should not stay. He put that list out, and that created uh, momentum to some others, followed suit, and soon thereafter, it was settled. Hmm. Wow, that is really cool. And you're going to learn a lot more about all these other saints as well as you read this book. Um, so, talking about reading this book, um, who is who is the audience, right? Who is this written for? Is this just for history nerds? Is this just for for those who want to read more about the saints? Who's who's the audience of this book? Well, the audience is the general Catholic in the pew, and perhaps even some non-Catholics who are interested in Catholic history. It's not an academic history. You know, most of them are longer. This is about 300 pages of text, uh, uh, which I think is about the average length of a uh, of a beach novel or, mm -hmm. or whatever. It's long enough to cover history, but it's short enough, so it's kind of a, a, a brisk walk through these 2,000 years. So I'm not aiming for the, uh, um, the scholar who works at University of what. Um, I'm aiming for the regular person in the pew. And since I'm not a professional historian, I'm not a theologian. I know a little bit about both. I'm a student of each. Uh, but it's almost like, hey, let's walk together and through this and, and see the wonderful things God has done over the course of these 2,000 years through these remarkable people. Yeah, I, I would totally agree because, uh, you know, I've, I've had to read this. And, and, you know, scholarly works are not something that I'm really good at reading. Uh, not a scholar. And, and this was a, a nice easy read, um, real comfortable. Um, in fact, to the point where, you know, I was able to help translate that to, to eighth graders. You know, it's such an easy read and, um, and yeah, you know, you don't get stuck in the weeds with all the, the biographies. You really, you know, let the saints come to life and show their, their amazing impact on history. And so, yeah, it's a nice, um, a, a good read for, for anybody. And, and so with that in mind, um, there's a section in the back, too, I really want to talk about. Um, here you've got uh, questions for reflection and discussion. Each chapter has you know, a handful of, of small questions. Uh, can you talk about that for a minute? Uh, yes. Uh, I guess uh, I have a certain teaching gene in me, even though I, I'm not a teacher. And so I like to, and that's what kind of what, what I was trying to do with this book. And I just started thinking, well, maybe I ought to put some reflection. This might be useful for uh, church uh, book groups mm -hmm. or possibly within high schools or, or, or other areas. So I started writing them and I like to, to pick and to probe. And so I wrote out some what I thought were some fairly substantial questions uh, on each of the six sections of the book, about five questions for each one. And my editor didn't uh, mess with them at all. She says, you know, most of the time, authors write namby-pamby little questions. <laughs> uh, uh, and maybe at the end, I say, "What were the most significant saints of the period?" That's kind of a, but, but, I, but I wanted to be a little more hard-hitting. You know, why did this happen? You know, um, why was Rome uh, spared during the plague and Avignon was not? Was this punishment, uh, reward, or whatever? And uh, I don't think so. But still, it's worth thinking about. Yeah. Uh, or what about uh, in the, the incredibly important Battle of Vienna uh, in 1683, which wasn't that long ago, really, where had Vienna fallen, we might all be worshiping on Fridays. Mm -hmm. uh, um, was it Providence or not that uh, um, the Ottoman uh, army was not able to get their um, artillery up to Vienna because of heavy rains that summer as they were getting into position and the roads were all filled with mud and they had to leave their artillery behind. That gave Vienna just enough time for Polish King Jan Sobieski to come with his cavalry and save the day. And it's almost like a, uh, uh, a bad movie. He shows up just as the walls are breached. But if they had had, if those rains hadn't happened, so I'm asking the question, does that, uh, is that providence, or is that just uh, well a lucky break? You know, so, so those are the kinds of questions I like to ask in there, just to get people thinking about what is God doing, or how did this all come to be over the course of these uh, last two thousand years. Ah, those are fascinating questions too, like open-ended, speculative. Uh, you definitely have that teaching gene in you, because that's those are uh, when I was teaching, I love the speculative questions, like, hey, what do you think would have happened to this, or what do you think about this? And man, the, the conversations that can come from these questions are, are, have got to be 
amazing. And, and I have a little bit of cover because I'm not uh, academic or smart enough to know the answers, so, but, but I can ask the questions. That's right. There's no answer key. It's just, just the questions. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And so I, I would say definitely even for a small group study, like this book would be really good for that. Hey, let's take this one section and in a couple of weeks we'll come back and we'll, we'll jump into those questions and have, you know, really good discussion or even, you know, you know, go to a bar and over a beer, right? Those mm-hmm. are great questions to, to have over a beer. Mm-hmm. Thank um, you. And, and make you feel like an academic, you know, like we're going <laughs> to discuss these lofty questions that, that you've posed and uh, that's great that's fantastic um any other thoughts about the book anything you want to add well i'm just looking at some of the saints you say i've been mulling over saints that uh, surprised me um one that caught me off guard was uh saint francis Xavier cabrini mm. um she uh, i read one of those old sappy uh biographies <laughs> of her, but you know, even the old sappy ones are filled with a, a, a lot of, of great stuff. And uh, she was one of the greatest missionaries in the history of the church. Mm. And uh, oh, the, oh, here's a, a story I gotta tell you. Uh, a non-saint that I admire a lot was Pope Leo the Thirteenth, late 1900s, 1800s, late 19th century. In the year 1887, he met in papal audiences three women who became saints and he sent them on their way, and he was instrumental in sending each of the three of them on their way. One of them is uh, um, Mother Cabrini, who shows up as an Italian nun and says, I have a passion, uh, Holy Father, to be a missionary in Asia. And he says, no, I want you to go to New York and minister Ah. to the Italian uh, Catholics who are really in dire need. Uh, uh, St. Catherine Drexel shows up, uh, a a well-to-do, holy woman, uh, she has an audience. She says, Holy Father, I was in the interior by the, of, of America by the Mississippi. They need evangelism. They need missionaries. Can you send an order of priests or nuns there? And he said to her, you do it. And she gulped <laughs> and she did it. And then later that same year, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux shows up as a 15-year-old oh girl. Wow. And she says, Holy Father, they won't let me into the Carmelite convent. Will you, convent, will you please let them uh, let me in? And he said, well, it's God's will. He didn't interject, but he may have prayed for her because just two months later, something happened, and all of a sudden they let her in. And so that all happened to St. Leo, Pope Leo the Thirteenth in 1887. But anyway, very quickly, uh, Mother Cabrini, she crossed the Atlantic, 20 times. Oh my gosh. She went to New York, she went to Chicago, she went to Denver, she went to California, all over other places in America, left her imprint, fought City Hall, uh, hospitals, orphanages, schools. She went down to South America, Buenos Aires, and other places down there. She went back to Europe and Paris. She was absolutely remarkable in what she did all over several continents to, to spread the gospel, particularly among the Italian immigrants. But uh, I, when I closed that book, I thought, wow, what a remarkable story. It's a great example. You know, the, the, the early nuns were probably the first tr- and the truest feminists. She and Catherine Drexel and Elizabeth Ann Seton, who, who just, uh, uh, they love God and they serve their hearts out until they, the day they dropped. And uh, um, we owe a lot of gratitude here in America for, for those three particularly, and then the ones that we don't know around them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, the big takeaway from this book is that you know, God uses these people in such important roles throughout history, but they had to say yes to the, to the will of God in their life. Every single one of them had to, to wrestle with you know, my will or his will, and, and thank God they all chose God's will, and that's the same thing that's posed to us. Are we going to do our will or are we going to do God's will? And, yeah. yeah, you know, and another story here is that, uh, and one of the themes uh, uh, of my book is that, you know, we always hear that we're all called to be saints, and that is true, but we're also called to nurture the people around us because we don't know if we might be nurturing a saint ourselves. Yeah. And I think of, uh, um, obviously, uh, we talked about St. Clotilda, and another saint I never heard of, St. Marcrina who was the big sister of uh, St. Basil and St. Gregory uh, of Nisus, I think it is. And Basil comes back from um, college in Athens, and he's got the big A uh, letter on his jacket, (laughs) and he's ready to go out there and enter a a, uh, 
a, uh, uh, a secular career, and Big Sister Macrina, Saint Macrina says, let me sit down here, we gotta talk, uh, Basil. You're not gonna throw your life away when you have so many gifts to serve the Lord with. And he convinced him to um, give his life to the Lord and to serve the Lord, and he had a great ministry. And so she was, so she was instrumental. And of course, we both have a background in St. John, oh, St. John Vianney Parish. And St. John, we wouldn't have St. John Vianney if it wasn't for a, a priest who's not canonized, named Abbe Bailey, who saw the faith in this little farm boy, who knew that he was struggling to get through seminary, and he pushed and pushed and pushed and pulled strings and got him ordained. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for Abbe Bailey, we would not have had St. John Vianney. And there's a lot of stories in the book that uh, allude to this kind of ministry, quiet ministry. And so, again, we might be having that same role ourselves. We don't know who it is that we might be inspiring who's gonna go on after we die to be the next great saint in the 21st century. Oh, wow. Oh, that's fantastic. I love that. Uh, once again, where can, where can people find this book? Uh, we can find this book at uh, uh, our Sunday Visitor Press, osvcatholicbookstore.com. And you know, Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble both have their, uh, they, they sell it as well. It should be in the bookstores too. Amazon and Barnes and Noble do have it in Kindle and Nook version, uh, if that's the way, if you w wish to have an ebook. And uh, I hope uh, very soon, if not already, uh, a lot of the Catholic bookstores will be carrying it as well. Fantastic. Well, this book, it's my stamp of approval. It is fantastic. You all should buy a copy. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Father Tony. Absolutely. We'll see you all next week.